our prayers. So if you have a Bible, why don't you turn to uh, Proverbs chapter 4. So this is a time when we gather around God's Word together and just continue in our worship as we study and reflect on God's Word uh, together. Um, and so Proverbs chapter 4 verse 20 through 27 is where I'm going to be reading from. And it says the following. My son, pay attention to what I say. Listen closely to my words. Do not let them out of your sight. Keep them within your heart. For they are life to those who find them and health to a, whole man's, to a man's whole body. Above all else, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of your life. Put away perversity from your mouth and keep corrupt talk far from your lips. Let your eyes look straight ahead. Fix your gaze directly before you. Make level paths for your feet and take only ways that are firm. Do not swerve to the right or the left. Keep your foot from evil. It's God's word to us uh, this morning. So um, if you're doing the Bible reading plan with us, you'll know that we're, we're in Proverbs or just been reading part of Proverbs during the, course of the, uh, during the course of this week and reflecting on some of those passages of, uh, of Scripture. And, and if you've been doing the plan, you, you will know that there's, uh, there's a backstory to the passage that I've just read for you. Um, there's a little episode that happens in 1 Kings chapter 3 that we need to go back and have a look at in order to get a greater understanding of what is happening here in, in Proverbs chapter 3. And if you do that, you go back to 1 Kings 3, then you'll find it's that, that well-known story where God comes to King Solomon in, in the dead of night and he appears to him in a dream and he makes him an offer that he cannot refuse. Do you remember? It's in the dead of night, and it's in a dream, so I imagine that everything is, is really quiet. Uh, the fires from the altar where Solomon has been offering the different animal sacrifices that were required, those fires are slowly but surely cooling down, and sentries have been posted to guard around the town where they are to make sure that they're safe, and animals are making noises that animals make at night, and people are snoring next to or near to Solomon, and maybe somebody's talking in their sleep, and... When all is still, when all is quiet, the Lord God Almighty appears to Solomon. And he makes him an offer that he can't refuse. It goes like this. Ask me for whatever you want, and I'll give it to you. And we hear that, and if you're familiar with the story, it's just like, yeah, mm, yeah, I remember the story. But don't miss the mind-blowingly crazy thing that God is offering to Solomon. It's not the same as if, Solomon's mother came to him and said, ask me for whatever you want and I'll give it to you. It's not the same as if one of Solomon's commanders came to him and said, hey, boss, ask me for whatever you want and I'll give it to you. We're, we're talking about the Lord God Almighty, right? The Lord God Almighty who makes the sun rise and set. The one who flings stars into space. The one who spoke creation into being. The one that the psalmist speaks of and says, he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. So we're talking about the one who has unlimited, unending resources. This one is coming to Solomon and saying, it's a blank check, just you fill it in. Ask me for whatever you want. How many of you are like, I wish I dreamt like that, right? <laughs> You're thinking, but what would you fill in? If God appeared to you in the same way and said to you, listen, wh whatever you want, fill it in. Just, just tell, tell me, I'll, I'll, I'll give it to you. I mean, I, I imagine that Solomon had a list of things he could have asked for, right? Uh, 1 Kings chapter 2, the last verse, it says that now the kingdom was firmly established in Solomon's hands. All right, if you read uh, chapter 2, the, the chapter is kind of dripping with blood, really, as, as Solomon sorts out all of his, his enemies. But now the kingdom is firmly in his grasp. But if you look at Solomon, you think, man, he's got such a big job ahead of him. He's got to lead this great nation. He's got a massive building project in the temple that needs to be built. He's got to fill the really big shoes that David uh, left behind. I mean, every time somebody looks at Solomon, they're probably measuring him up to David. Oh, David wouldn't have done it like that. No, it would have been, you know. So he's got these really big shoes that he needs to fill. And if, if as Solomon is going to bed that night, he's probably thinking to himself, oh, man, if only I would ask for all these different things. I, I would ask for military and strategic genius like my dad. 
I would ask for secure borders. I would ask for a flourishing economy. I would ask for a fantastic gift day that provided enough so that I can build the temple. I would ask for friends and leaders around me who won't stab me in the back, but who will, who will use their wisdom to help me and to, to progress. He's probably got this long list of all these different things that he could ask for. And he skips past all of it. Or maybe he's got something right at the top of that. And he says, give me wisdom. God's saying, you can ask for whatever it is, whatever you want, and I'm going to give it to you. And Solomon's asked it to answer to that is, Give me wisdom. And in a sense, if you, if you take that phrase, give me wisdom, out of 1 Kings 3, and you read 1 Kings 3 through that lens, then in a sense, it shows us, 1 Kings 3 shows us the birthplace of wisdom. So, so if you've ever thought to yourself, do you know what, I've read the story, I want to be wise like Solomon, I want to grow in wisdom, then 1 Kings 3 kind of gives you the prerequisites, the things that you need to have in place before you can grow in biblical wisdom. You discover as you read 1 Kings 3 that number one, top of the list, it me needs to be a love for God. 1 Kings 3 verse 3, it says that Solomon loved the Lord and demonstrated his love for God by walking according to God's ways. It's two things that go hand in hand together, right? If we love God, we will walk with grace-fueled obedience before God. And if we walk with grace-fueled obedience before God, it will be a demonstration of the degree to which we love God. Does that make sense? I mean, Jesus said as much, right? In John's gospel, he's talking to his friends and he says, if you love me, if you love me, here's the proof of that love, you will obey my commands. And the first thing we need in place, if we're going to be wise people, is this a love for God. But that then leads to a correct understanding of who God is is what Solomon is later on going to describe as the fear of the Lord. Not as in cringing fear, God's going to get me with a thunderbolt if I do anything wrong, but reverence and, and, and awe and, and wonder at who God is. And when you read 1 Kings 3, you, you get to see who Solomon's God is. He's the sovereign God, the one who reigns and rules over all things, the one that sets the standard for moral behavior, the one who is holy, the one who is pure, the one who is righteous. And so Solomon is saying, I'm not going to look to culture for, for what is morally correct. I'm not going to look to the surrounding nation for what is morally correct. I'm going to look to God. He's the one that sets the standard. And as Solomon has come to this place of worship, he's realized, I've fallen short of that standard. And it's why he brings the sacrifices that he brings. Solomon looks at God and he says, you're the creator. The one that establishes everything, the one that holds everything, the one who is all-powerful and uh, uh, can establish thrones and remove thrones. And he, he acknowledges in 1 Kings 3, he says, God, the only reason why I have a throne to sit on is because you placed me there. Without you, it wasn't happening. He looks at God and he's like, you are the only wise God, the only one that I can come to wisdom for. I mean, Solomon's audacious request, God, make me wise, only makes sense because he's asking God for this wisdom. So it's a love for God. It's a correct view of God, which then leads to a correct understanding of ourselves. We, we, we can only have a right perspective and view of our own lives when we see God for who he is. And Solomon's view of himself, he's like, bear in mind, he's one of the most powerful men of the time. He's seated on this magnificent throne and he says to God, I'm just a child. I'm inexperienced. God, I don't have what it takes to be able to do that which you have called me to. Th these are the prerequisites for growing in wisdom. A deep love for God, a correct view or fear of God, and a correct view of ourselves before God. And Solomon's got all three of these things in place. And so God says, ask me for whatever you want. And Solomon's like, give me a wise and discerning heart. Then I might tell the difference between right and wrong. And God says, you got it. I imagine if God was into this, I imagine the Lord bending down to give Solomon a fist bump and say, well done, son. That's what you were meant to say, right? That, that's the answer that I was hoping for. And, and God gives it to him. God gives him wisdom. And so by the time that Proverbs 4 is written, my guess is that the nation are living in the fruitfulness and flourishing that comes from wise living. 
If you had to take, do a health check on the nation of Israel, around about the time that Proverbs 4 is written, my guess is that you would find a steady heartbeat and a strong pulse and a robust pulse. The borders are secure. The economy is flourishing. Building projects are being completed. And everything is well. And it's in that context that Solomon pens Proverbs chapter 4, or many of the different Proverbs. He's saying, listen, he's writing to his son or whoever's going to be listening. If you've read Proverbs chapter 1 through 9, you'll know that it's punctuated with this phrase, listen, my son, my son, pay attention, mark my words, etc., etc., the different sections. And it's almost Solomon saying, listen, I, I figured out a way how to do life. It's, with, it, it's living with godly wisdom. And if you live with godly wisdom, this is how it's going to work out in your life. So here's the thing, Solomon. Make sure that you listen to my words. Or Solomon saying to other people, to his sons, make sure you listen to my words. Make sure you pay attention to them. Make sure you hide them in your heart because they're going to lead to life and they're going to lead to the health of your whole body. And if you had to pick up Proverbs chapter 4, and read that phrase, you'd, you'd ask the question, what are the words that he's talking about? And the answer is wisdom, which would probably then lead to another question. So what is biblical wisdom? How would you define biblical wisdom? And it seems to me that it's another one of those notoriously difficult phrases that we need to try and kind of get a handle on and a description on. If you go to the Oxford English Dictionary, it has, has this definition, the quality of having experience, knowledge, and good judgment. Make sense? Yeah? If you go to the Bible Dictionary, it's a little bit more succinct. It says the following, the ability to discern right choices. If you go to a Bible scholar, he says the following, the power to see, the inclination to choose, the best and highest goal, together with the surest means of attaining it. That's a mouthful, right? Yeah. Are you any clearer on what biblical wisdom is, by the way? Right? You're all like, what? You know. uh, still another preacher phrases the question in this way. He says, in light of my past experience, in light of my current circumstances, in light of my future hopes and dreams, what is the wise thing to do? So my question for you then is, which one is it? And you're all kind of like scratching your heads. Ah, I'm not sure. That, you know. So here's the simple version. Here's my version because I'm a simple person and I like things to be easy and, you know, so on, all right? Biblical wisdom is this. Three things. Knowing stuff, reading the room, and the courage to act. That's it. All right? Knowing stuff, reading the room, and the courage to act. Knowing stuff means that you know stuff, okay? <laughs> Beginning with knowing God, right? You know who God is. You know what pleases God. You know how to walk in obedience with God. You, you know stuff about God. But it doesn't just stop there. It's knowing stuff about stuff. I mean, Solomon knew about plant life, the great cedars of Lebanon, but also the hyssop, hyssop bushes that grew in the walls. He knew about animal life and plant life and life in the sea, and, and he knew stuff about stuff. But then the next part is reading the room, knowing, being able to read a room and Judge the context and situation that you are in so that you can apply the knowledge that you have in the right way. Does that make sense? Because sometimes you may know stuff, but the situation that you're in calls for different responses in the stuff that you know. Yeah? Okay? And then the courage to choose. The courage to choose. And sometimes it will require courage because what you know, what you've discerned in reading the room... And what action it requires from you in any given moment will be totally counterintuitive. You will think one plus one is not making two <laughs> in this situation. And then we fall back. I think it's Proverbs 3 verse 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your paths straight. Right? Sometimes when we have the courage to act on what we know and how we've read the room, it requires courage because it's going to seem totally counterintuitive. But it seems to me that this biblical wisdom, knowing about God and who He is and what He requires from us, reading the room correctly and the courage to act, this kind of wisdom, it leads to exalting God in our life. It leads to a concern for His kingdom. It leads to moral living. Let me give you a few examples just so that it, hopefully it will make a little bit more 
more sense. If we take these three things, knowing stuff, reading the room, and the courage to act, and we apply them to some of the sayings that I've read here this morning, here's how it breaks down. So the proverb here is, uh, above all else, guard your heart, for from within it, everything else flows. For your life flows from your heart. Above all else, guard your heart, because it is the wellspring of your life, the NIV says. All right. So what do we know? Well, we know that there's stuff that's out there in the world that if we allow it to have a resting place in our heart, it's going to affect our lives, either in a good way or a bad way. You read through the Proverbs. It gives you example after example. Um, greed. Uh, Proverbs 13, 27. A greedy man brings trouble to his family. So if you allow greed to be the number one thing in your heart, you're going to bring trouble to your family. If you're just chasing off the money, you're, you're going to bring trouble to your family and to those loved ones around you. Gossip. all right. A perverse man stirs up dissension. A gossip separates close friends. All right? and it doesn't matter where the gossip takes place, whether it's on Snapchat or Instagram or WhatsApp or Facebook or whatever. You know, th This is what gossip does. It, it separates close friends. You're allowed to find a, a resting place in your heart, and you're going to be breaking relationships all over the shop. Lust. Do not lust in your heart after her beauty or let her captivate you with her eyes. For the prostitute reduces you to a loaf of bread and the adulteress preys on your very life. There, there are things that are, that, are, that are out there that if we allow them to find a resting place in our heart, they're going to play havoc in our lives. We know stuff. So now we need to read the room. And reading the room in this situation, it's, it's quite simple. We're just asking ourselves the question, what are the things, what are the situa when are the situations, where are the situations, who are the people that I need to steer clear of because if I hang out with them or if I click on that website or if I fill my mind with that sort of stuff, it's just going to wreck my life. Where do I need to put boundaries in my life and around my life to make sure that I have protected myself from, from these things that will come into my life, right? Yeah? And then the courage to act. And the courage to act doesn't stem from the place of, okay, I need to make a list of a whole lot of do-nots. You know, do-nots that you find in the Bible. Because a lot of people think that the Bible is a very negative thing. You know, it's a bunch of do-nots. Uh, do not do this. Do not do that. Do not do this. And I actually think the Bible is a wonderfully positive, life-giving thing that tells us over all the do-nots, there is a big do all right? It's positive instruction for our lives. So rather than thinking, do not do this, do not do that, and next thing, we can just think, no, do. Set your hearts on things that are above. Let the peace of Christ dwell in your heart. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. And guess what's going to happen? The life and the likeness of Jesus is going to be seen in your life. If you allow greed and gossip and lust, you, people are not going to see Jesus in your life. But if you allow, if you set your hearts on things above, if you said, allow the peace of Christ to rule in your heart, if you, if you let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, right, the life of Jesus is going to be seen in you. Does it make sense? All right, I'll give you another example. Keep your mouth from perversity and keep corrupt talk from your lips. So what do we know? The average person speaks 173 words per minute. That's a lot of words, right? That's a lot of words. That's pretty scary when you consider that the words that you speak, they have weight. They have weight. James, the brother of Jesus, he, writing about the tongue and speech, he said that the tongue is notoriously difficult to tame. He said it's a fire, a world of evil. It can set the whole course of a person's life on fire. And so Ecclesiastes, the writer there, warns and says, listen, don't be quick with your mouth. But let your words be few. All right, so this is, this is what we need to know, right? Now, how do we read the room in this situation? Well, it's quite simple. We go to Ecclesiastes, and Ecclesiastes tells us there is a time to speak, and there's a time to be silent. Your words will either be a wrecking ball in somebody's life that knocks them down, or they will be ointment and balm to a person's soul that will bind them up, lift them out of the mud and mire, and give their feet a firm place to stand. And guess what? 
you have the power to choose which one of these two things it's going to be. And you need to read the room. You need to read the room and think to yourself, man, is, are my words going to be helpful here? Is this going to make a difference in a person's life or is this just going to beat a person up? Paul writing to the Ephesian church, he says to them, don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only that which is useful for building others up according to their needs that that may benefit the person who is listening. Did you see where the weight of responsibility lies? Yeah? He didn't say, don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only that which is useful for you saying it as it is, putting the other person in their place and making sure that they know exactly how, they, how you feel. It's a marked difference, isn't there, right? <laughs> there is a marked difference. Right? The words that we speak, they're not intended to, like, I'm just going to say it as it is, and I'm going to win the argument, and I'm going to be right, and everybody's going to fall in, in line with me. No, no, we've got to ask, read the room and ask the question, hey, the words I'm about to speak, is this going to build another person up, or is it going to beat them up? And then we've got to have the courage to choose to say those words. And this is so hard, right? <laughs> this is so hard. Any parent that's had teenagers will know how difficult this is. Because there are some times that we just want to make sure that our teenage kids know what we are thinking, right? And we want to put them straight and put them in their place. And our teenage kids probably look at us and say, no, no, I know everything. I'm a teenager. You know nothing, right? And I'm going to put you in your place. And, and this is just a recipe for disaster, right? But sometimes the push and pull on the inside to just have our say and justify ourselves and not appear to be in the wrong and all this sort of thing, it just... And in that moment, you just got to shut up. <laughs> and it's so difficult. I'll give you another example so that... It Makes sense. Let your eyes look straight ahead of you. Fix your gaze directly before you. Give careful thought to your path for your feet and, and be steadfast in all your ways. So what is it that we know? The path you travel determines your destination. The path you travel, are walk, that you are walking on at the moment, determines your destination. The choices that you make determine the path that you are on. The friends you make will determine the path that you are on. Uh, it, it's, not your, it's not your good intentions that determine your destination. You know this, right? Don't put up your hand. All right? Did you hear that? Don't put up your hand. All right? How many of you made um, New Year's resolutions back in January? Don't put up your hand. All right? Seven months later, how many of you are still obeying the good intention New Year's resolution that you made? Don't put up your hand. Okay? <laughs> in a confessional, all right? All right? But, but do you get it? I mean, the good intentions that you had in January, I am not going to, or I am not this, or I will this, and you fill in the blank, they were just good intentions unless you actually acted upon them and are still consistently acting upon them. So how do we read the room in this situation? We know stuff, right? The path is going to determine our destination. So how do we read the room? Well, you need to pause maybe and take a, an hour or an afternoon or a morning or a whole day if you can and just get away with God and your journal and your Bible and just say to God, hey, God, what is the path that I am on at the moment? Help me to read the room here, God. What, what is the path that I am on? What choices am I making? What friends am I making? And, and God, would you give me a vision of where this is going to end up? And then you need the, the courage to choose. And one of the things that I, I've prayed for my sons regularly, and particularly when I was doing youth work in the life of the church here, when, when I started in ministry, one of the things that I would play, pray the most consistently for young people was this. God, give them a long view of life. Give them, give them a view of life that has the destination that they want to reach and to order their steps according to that, that goal, that destination. God, don't allow them to settle for immediate satisfaction over their ultimate goals. It takes courage, right? takes courage to do that. There's a few young people in this church that I've watched over the years doing exactly that. They had the end in mind, and at that end, ordered every single one of their steps. And now, years on, they've got a story that's worth telling. 
Because that's another question we can ask ourselves when we, we're, we're seeking to get the courage to act in the right way. We can ask ourselves, this path that I am on, these two choices that I'm making, these friends that I'm hanging out with, when I get to the end destination, wherever this is leading, is it, am I going to have a story that I want to tell other people? Am I going to have a story that's worth telling? Or are there going to be things that I'm just, oh, I'd rather not tell. I'd rather not talk about. Does it make sense? But there's a path that we choose. We know stuff. We can read the room and we've got the courage to choose. And if, if you're a Jesus follower, if you've put your trust in him, then there was a path that you chose once, right? There was that moment, maybe it was on a Sunday morning, now afternoon, like this, or maybe a conference that somebody took you to, or a camp or something like that, and you discovered things. You, you grew to know stuff, stuff like the, the, about the Lord God Almighty who created the, the heavens and the earth, just by speaking it into being, and that He's a good God who desires a relationship, has made every single human being for a relationship with Him, but that there's a problem, and it's called sin which separates us from God. And, and, and at that moment, you, you grew to this realization, do you know what? This is not just some religious mumbo-jumbo. This is true. My life, I, I've fallen short of the glory of God. I'm at war with God because of sin in my life. But in that same moment that you began to hear the gospel call, you read the room, and in the room, there, there stood a cross, not, perhaps not literally, but the message of the cross, that although we've taken our own path and we've wandered far from God, God has not just left us with our sin problem, but He sent His one and only Son, Jesus, into the world, who came and lived the perfect life that you and I couldn't live, who died the death that we deserve, and who opens up the door and says, hey, listen, anybody can come. Anybody can come. You can believe in me. You can put your trust in me. You can lay down all of your sin, all of your failure, all of your baggage, all of the mess that you have made in your life, and you can be made completely new. And there was a moment that we had the courage to choose, right? And maybe it did require courage, because maybe it was in a setting like this, and the, the woman or the man up in the front said, and you, and you can put your trust in Jesus today. And all you've got to do is just come to the front and sit here, and somebody's going to pray with you. And, and your heart was racing fast, and you got up, and maybe there was tears, and somebody came and prayed with you, and they led you to Jesus. And if you are a Jesus follower, you will look back on that moment this morning, and you will say, it is the greatest decision that I ever made. Amen? Everything changes. Everything changes from that moment. It was the wisest decision you ever made. But, but you know what? It, it's never just a one-time decision, is it? It's a decision we've got to keep on making. I don't know about you, but I, you can look at Solomon's story here and you can, you can think to yourself, oh, man, I wish I dreamed. I wish God would appear to me in a dream, you know. If he did and he said, ask for whatever you want, I know exactly what I'd ask for. I'd ask him for wisdom. Because then I get all the other stuff as well, you know. And, uh, yeah. and you can. And you can. It's all there before you. you know, what, what God offered to, uh, to Solomon, it wasn't something that just for him. We can come before God and we can say to God, God, grant me wisdom. All right, if you want to grow in biblical wisdom so that, you, so that you know stuff about God and how you should live, so that you can read a room, so that you have the courage to act, it begins with asking. We've just got to come to God and say, God, will you give me wisdom? James, the brother of Jesus, he, he said, he said, if any of you lacks wisdom, just go to God and ask him, and he'll give abundantly to you without judging you. I love that last little bit, right? Because sometimes we think, oh, well, it's only the clever that can go to God and ask for wisdom or the, the spiritually perfect that can go to ask for wisdom. No, God's not going to judge you. It means a simple person like me can go before God, a, a sinful, finite person like me. I can go to God and I can say, hey, God, will you grant me wisdom? I want to walk wisely with you. We then, number two, we immerse ourselves in God's Word, the, the, the psalm says, The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. We want wisdom, we just, we just read God's Word, right? And this is why we are doing the Bible reading plan. 
This is why we read the New Testament last year, why we are reading the Old Testament this year, why next year you'll be reading the New Testament again and somebody will be preaching through that. Right? It's all geared towards this, that we grow in wisdom. The third thing you can do is walk with people who are wise. So Proverbs 13, 20 said, He who walks with the wise will grow wise, but the companion of fools suffers harm. And that will demand something from you, right? You're going to have to look in the church family and ask yourself the question, who are the people that are wiser than me? Who are the people that know stuff, can read a room, and are courageously acting on, on these things that I can learn from? The great surprise is it might be somebody younger than you <laughs> who's actually wiser than you, right? You know, who, who these things are clicking for a little bit quicker than what it has done for you. It's a great thing. I love, I love this about church, right? But are you going to make time to find somebody who will be able to help you in this regard so that as you walk with them, you can grow wise? And then finally, the fourth thing. So you're asking, you're immersing yourself in God's Word, you're walking with those who are wise, and the final one is you've got to treasure wisdom. Treasure it constantly. Earlier on in chapter 4, uh, Solomon says the following. He says to his son, get wisdom, get understanding. Do not forget my words or swerve from them. Don't forsake wisdom, and she will protect you. Love her, and she'll watch over you. Wisdom is supreme. Therefore, get wisdom. Though it costs everything that you have, get understanding. Esteem her, and she will exalt you. Embrace her, and she will honor you. She will set a garland of grace around your head and present you with a crown, not a crown, crown of splendor, right? There's something about those verses that are just saying, go after this. Pursue this. You won't be disappointed. You will find it will make all the difference in your life. So if God had to stand before you and say to you this morning, ask me for whatever you want, I wonder what you'd say. And as Chris and the team come up and join me, I'll just finish by saying this for... Hopefully you've learned, or hopefully if you've been reading alongside with us, you would have picked up that it's not a one-time thing. The, the, the morning, the evening that you decided to follow Jesus, you know that it wasn't a one-time thing, right? It was the wisest decision you ever made. But Monday morning came, and six months later came with a battle, and you needed to, you needed to make the decision in your mind, no, today I'm going to follow Jesus. And the pursuit of wisdom, it's not something we can pray once on the 1st of January, God grant me wisdom, and I'm going to read the Bible lots, and, and then it's suddenly that one moment stores us up for the next 364 days, right? It's a constant thing. And as we look at, as we look at Solomon's story, for me, it, it just seems to me that, that the whole thing is just tinged with sadness and tinged with regret, because here is a guy who said, God, give me wisdom, and God gave it to him. So he knew stuff, and he was able to read the room like a boss. But at some point, he stopped acting courageously. And the moment that he stopped acting courageously, the fruitfulness of wisdom, wise living drained out of his life. I mean, think about it with me for a moment. Solomon wrote these words. It's words that I think that any husband should have underlined in their Bible. Proverbs chapter 5, verse 18. May your fountain be blessed. May you rejoice in the wife of your youth. A loving doe, a graceful deer. May her breasts satisfy you always. And may you ever be captivated by her love. The same guy who wrote that then went on to marry 700 wives and take 300 good concubines. You think, what happened? I mean, wh where did he go wrong? I mean, he knew stuff, right? I mean, he, he talks about the adulteress and that sort of thing all the way through the, the, the opening chapter. So he knew stuff. So what, what, what happened? Where, where did he go wrong? And it's in 1 Kings 9 that the answer comes, he loved many foreign women. He loved many foreign women. He knew stuff. 
he could read the room, he could see the beautiful woman and so on, but he needed to have the courage to act and live out the words that he had written in chapter 5. May the wife of your youth always satisfy you. As a result, these women led him astray. And you get to 1 Kings chapter 11, and we read the chilling words, The Lord became angry with Solomon because his heart had turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice. Don't miss this, friends, right? God will give you wisdom. If you ask and if you immerse yourself in Scripture and you hang out with wise people and you pursue wisdom and so on, God God will give you wisdom. He will. He's gracious like that. And and you will grow in the discipline of of reading the room and knowing how to apply the stuff that you know to any given situation. But without the courage to act, without the courage to act, the knowing of stuff and the reading the room means nothing. It ends up where Solomon ended up in the last years of his life, fighting battles on every side. He went from fruitful and secure on every side to fighting battles on every side. And the son that he was counseling in the opening nine chapters, my son, listen, my son, pay attention, his son went completely off the rails as well. And so as we reflect on his life and we reflect on these words, I think our prayer should be, God, will you grant us wisdom? But would you give us the courage to act as well? And do you know if God does and we do, it will will breathe life into your worship. (laughs) Because when you walk in obedience, grace-fueled obedience to God, guess what happens? Blessing comes into your life. Favor comes into your life. And so every morning you're going to be waking up and you're going to be like, thank you, Jesus, for a new day. Thank you for all the good things that you are doing in my life. Thank you for the way in which you are shaping me and making me. God, all glory to you. It will fuel your worship. It will also put strength into your discipleship. You will look back at each day and you will say, I've been making these decisions and it's leading to this fruitfulness. Do you know what? I'm going to rinse, repeat and do the same thing that I did yesterday again today. I'm going to trust in the Lord with all my heart. I'm not going to lean on my own understanding. In all my ways, I'm going to acknowledge Him because He makes my path straight. And it will make you effective in mission. Because people are going to look at your life and they're going to say, how do you do it? How do you do it? What's your secret? What's the secret source of your life, right? (laughs) What is the thing that's making a difference in your life that you you act so wisely, you make the right decisions and, 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 and so on, and you'll be able to say, his name is Jesus. My friend, he's my Lord, he's my Savior, he's my Master, he's the one that I walk with the one who directs my paths. Do you want to know him? Do you want to come and find out about the difference that he makes to life? We've got a baptismal service on 3rd of September. May God grant us this wisdom. May God grant us this courage and build within to our hearts a grace-fueled obedience that we might walk with him wisely. 